Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part 8 of Candy Floss by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from chapter 16. School was heavenly now I was sitting next to Susan. I even enjoyed maths. Well, I didn't exactly enjoy it, but it was quite companionable having Susan go through each sum with me and tell me what to do. We also started a numbers project together in a notebook exactly a hundred pages long. Susan wrote about famous mathematicians like Galileo and Pythagoras. I found out about numerology and wrote out my name and Susan's name and checked off all the vowels and consonants and found out we were deeply compatible, but we knew that anyway. Susan wrote out neat examples of addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. She even did really difficult stuff her dad had taught her, like algebra and geometry. I coloured in all her circles and triangles. Susan wrote about the abacus. I invented my own join the number dots puzzle. Susan did a wonderful diagram of a calculator. I copied out counting rhymes like one, two, buckle my shoe. Mrs Horsfield said it was excellent, and she'd definitely mark it ten out of ten. Rhiannon muttered behind us, one, two, don't they make you spew, three, four, they're such a bore, five, six, up to nerdy tricks. As if we cared. I started making a list of all the things Susan might want to do on Saturday. The cafe was closing for good on Friday, so Dad would be free to take us anywhere. I thought about all the special treats I'd had with Mum and Steve. On Saturday, Susan and I could, one, go to Chessington World of Adventures in Dad's van and go on all the rides, even the scary ones. Two, go on, go to the seaside in Dad's van and have ice creams on the pier and make a ginormous sandcastle and go on a boat trip. Three, go to the country in Dad's van and walk up to the top of a big hill and have a picnic and paddle in a stream. Four, go up to town in Dad's van and go on the London Eye and Dad can row us on the Serpentine and we can play in Princess Diana's Park. Five, Go to Bethnal Green Toy Museum in Dad's van and we can count all the dolls and look at the dolls' houses and play giant drafts. Six, go to Greenwich in Dad's van and run all the way through the tunnel under the river and go to the market and see the Cutty Sark. Seven, go to London Zoo in Dad's van and see all the monkeys and the elephants and the penguins and watch them being fed. Eight, go to the National Gallery in Dad's van and choose our top ten favourite paintings and then climb on the lions in Trafalgar Square. 9. Go to the Polka Theatre in Dad's van and ride on the rocking horse and see a play and then have a pizza afterwards. 10. Go to the National History Museum in Dad's van and see all the dinosaurs and then have tea in the shop over the road and be allowed two cakes each. Memo, we don't want to go to the Green Glade Shopping Centre. I showed Dad the list when he tucked me up in bed that night. What about going to Disneyland in Dad's van? He said. Going for a world tour in Dad's van? Flying to the moon in Dad's van? I suppose I got a bit carried away, I said, wanting to kick myself. I'd forgotten just how much of those days out would cost. I wasn't being serious, Dad. I was just making a silly list. You know what I'm like. No, we could just go for a little drive out in the van, maybe for a picnic. Or we could just go to the park. Maybe we'll skip feeding the ducks. Susan might feel she's a little too old, though of course I love feeding them. Oh, Dad, if only the fair was still here, wouldn't that be great? We could go on the roundabout. Susan and I could squash up on the pearl together, and we could have both have a candy floss from Rose's stall. Maybe she'd invite us all back to her lovely caravan. That would be so fantastic. Yes, it would be, said Dad. Only the fare's not here, and I'm afraid I just don't have the cash for the other outings. I've got to be careful with petrol, too. I reckon we might need a couple of trips to Billy's house with all our stuff, and then I've promised to drive him to the airport, Dad paused. I went round to dip Billy's today, Floss. It's... it's a bit... I looked at Dad. It's a bit what, Dad? Dad gestured vaguely, his arms stretched wide. Well, you see for yourself. I'll do my level best to make you a pretty little bedroom somehow. Everything will be okay, touch wood. He tapped his head and then glanced around my bedroom. He looked at the faded fairy wallpaper I'd had ever since I was a baby. The curtains falling off the rail, the wonky chest of drawers, half-painted silver, the pale pink carpet which was now sludgy grey with age. I sighed. I thought about the time when it was all new and clean and fresh, and Mum and Dad tucked me up in bed together and took turns telling me stories about the fairies flying up the wall. Dad sighed too. I'm not much cop at decorating, Lark, am I? Floss. Never mind, Dad. I'm not much cop at anything, am I? Don't, Dad. You're fine. We'll be fine. You, me and Lucky. I picked her up and held her close. Did you meet Billy the Chip's cats, Dad? What are they like? Well, they're huge compared with our little Lucky. Oh no. Do you think they'll bully her? No, no, I think they're too old and tubby to do anything much but sleep, Dad yawned. Like your old dad. I'm totally knackered, Floss, and yet I've still got to get trips with all this packing. I'm so, Dad, I'm so sorry, darling, but I'm going to be busy most of Saturday. I think you and Susan will just have to amuse yourselves. But you'll make chip butties, won't you, Dad? I'll make you chip butties fit for a queen. Well, two little princesses. 
Dad gave me a big kiss on my curls, and he gave Lucky a big kiss on her fur, and then he tucked us both up, me in bed, Lucky in her duvet nest. I snuggled down with dog and elephant. I twiddled elephant's trunk round my fingers and tucked dog's limp ear over my nose, limp ear over my nose like a little cuddle blanket. I was becoming very fond of them. I didn't exactly play with them, but they were starting to develop personalities. Elephant was called Ellerina and was a bit flighty. She liked to show off and twirl her trunk in the air. Dog was called Dimble. He quivered at any sudden movement or loud noise. He did his best not to look at all mouse-like whenever Lucky was near him. I couldn't decide whether to introduce them to Susan. She wouldn't tease me like Rhiannon, but she might privately think me a total baby. Do you have any cuddly toys, Susan? I asked as casually as I could on Friday morning. You mean teddy bears? No, I think I had one in my cot when I was very little, but I don't have any now. Oh, I said, resolving to hide Ellerina and Dimble under my bed. I'm not anti-teddy, I just don't like the feel of their fur very much. I've got uncuddly toys, though. I've got eleven little wooden elephants, one wooden giraffe, one pair of crocodiles with jaws that snap open and shut, and three china rabbits, one pink, one blue, and one big green one, with two towers over all the other animals, even the elephants. But they're like ornaments. Do you, do you actually play with them? Exactly how, I, how could I play with them? Susan asked. You could give them names and make them funny or naughty or shy, and maybe take them out into the garden and play jungles. You could turn your mum's washing up bowl into a watering hole and make a big earth mountain for them to trek up and down. That sounds like a lot more fun than just dusting them, said Susan. You do get good ideas, Floss. She paused. Would you mind terribly if we didn't go on one of those special outings on your list this Saturday? I mean, they all sound lovely, and if that's what you really want to do, that's fine with me, but I'd sooner make the most of our time together just playing. Is that okay? Of course, I said, deeply relieved. Susan paused again. Look, Floss, this is terribly rude of me, but I couldn't come in the morning too, could I? I so want to have a proper long time together, and also my mum and dad are supposed to be going to this education conference all day. They're both giving papers, and I was going to have to trail along too and lurk in a corner somewhere reading a book. But if you're kind enough to invite me, I could be with you. Education? Are your mum and dad teachers? Kind of. They teach teachers how to be teachers. They used to be at Oxford, but now they've both got jobs near here. Are they posh? I said. And then I blushed because it sounded so stupid. <laughs> They'd die if anyone thought they were posh, said Susan. They are posh, though. My mum even went to boarding school, but they try to act just ordinary. I didn't quite get this. Rhiannon's mum and maybe even my mum were just ordinary, and yet they tried hard to pretend they were posh. It was a novelty to think Susan's mum and dad pretended the other way round. Well, dad and I definitely aren't posh, I said, and I'd love you to come as early, early as you want. That would be brilliant. But the whole place is going to be an awful mess. Dad and I will be packing everything. We wanted to try and get it all done before you came. Can't I help? I'm absolutely ace at packing because we've moved heaps and heaps of times. Okay then, if you really don't mind. That's what friends are for, said Susan. Did you have a best friend at your old school? Not really, said Susan. It's always horrible starting at a new school because you stick out so. And I seem to be the sort of person that gets picked on. Rhiannon thinks she's so original, but they used to call me Swatty Potty at my old school too. Maybe I ought to change my name by deed poll. My mum wanted to change my name when she split up with Dad. She wanted me to add Steve's name on with a hyphen, but I wouldn't. He's not my dad. He's not anything to do with me. He's just my mum's new partner. All these partners, said Susan. I tried to do a family tree on his, this big wall chart, but it got so complicated. I did it all in my best italic handwriting, in red ink, but then I had to keep crossing bits out because people kept splitting up. Then my mum's ex-partner kept having new babies with each new lady, so that side of a family tree got much too crowded. It ended up looking such a mess, I crumpled it all up and threw it away. That's why I like maths so. The numbers don't wriggle about in chains, you can just add them up or subtract them or multiply or divide them. Whatever, but you always get the answer you want. Only if you're you. My numbers wriggle all over the place and I never get the right answer unless I copy off you, I said. Okay then, Susan, you come as early as you like on Saturday. Chapter 17 My early wasn't quite the same as Susan's. Dad and I weren't even up when the doorbell rang. We stumbled downstairs, me and my nighty, Dad in his old pyjama bottoms with a t-shirt on his top. We opened the door. There was Susan and her dad. We peered at them, mortified. Dad frantically combed his sticking up hair with his fingers. I rubbed my eyes and pulled the hem of my nightie down as far as it would go, hoping it might just look like a dress. We didn't convince Susan's dad. I'm so sorry. Uh, we've obviously got you out of bed. How awful, he said. He was much older than my dad, more like a granddad, but he was dressed sort of young in a black t-shirt and jeans and a denim jacket with the sleeves rolled up to try to look casual. 
His own hair looked as if it needed a good brush. He seemed what Mum would call dead scruffy, but try as he might, he couldn't make his voice sound anything but ultra posh and plummy. Yes, I agree. It is awful of us. I, I think I must have slept through the alarm. I've been at sixes and sevens recently. You know what it's like, mate, Dad blurted. No, no, I meant we're awful. Arriving so horrendously early, mate, said Mr Potts. It's so good of you to say you'll have Susan for the day. I, I gather she rather invited herself, but I can see it's the worst possible time for you. He waved vaguely at the cardboard boxes, scattered all over the hall, like a giant toddler's building blocks. Susan's very welcome, said Dad, smiling at her, just so long as she doesn't mind a bit of chaos. Oh, she's used to that in her own home, said Mr Potts, and he gave Susan's shoulder a little squeeze. You know my mobile number and Mum's, don't you? Ring if there's any problem. Otherwise, we'll come and pick you up about seven-ish. Is that really OK? He was looking at Dad. He nodded and smiled. Susan nodded and smiled. I nodded and smiled too. Thanks again. We owe you big time. Maybe your floss might like to come to us next Saturday. Oh, oh yes, please, Susan and I said in unison, while the dads laughed. Then Mr Potts waved and walked to his car, neatly kicking two Coke cans into the gutter. I could see Mrs Potts sitting in the front of their car. She had grey hair piled up in an untidy bun and little round glasses like Susan's. She was wearing a dark red pe peasant blouse and a big yellow bead necklace. She waved too. I waved back shyly. Right, said Dad. I'd better get myself washed and dressed pronto and then see about breakfast. Have you had breakfast, Susan? I'm sure you can manage another anyway. Oh, good. Can we have chip butty? Susan asked eagerly. Dad laughed. You can have a chip butty for your lunch. You might even have another for your tea, but I think we'll draw the line at butties for breakfast. How about cornflakes? Lucky came sliding down the stairs, not sure who this new visitor was. Ooh, she's so lovely, said Susan, crouching down and holding out her hand. Lucky hesitated and then took two steps forward on her dainty paws, prepared to make friends. You're so lucky to have a cat, said Susan. My dad is allergic to cat's fur. Well, he says he is. A mum fusses about their claws. We've got all these leather-bound books and she says she'd use them like a scratching post. Well, we like for Lucky's fur. I might well wrap her round my neck in the winter instead of a scarf. She'll keep me nice and cosy. And all our stuff is scratched to bits anyway, said Dad. I'm a bit of a scratcher myself, come to think of it. He bowed his legs in a chimp stance and scratched his chest. Dad, I said. Oops, sorry. I'd better go and have my shower now. Wash the fleas off. Dad, I said. Dad ran up the stairs making monkey noises. I rolled my eyes and Susan giggled. Let's give Lucky her breakfast, I said. Lucky's cat food looked pretty disgusting. Lumpy brown slurp, but she seemed enthusiastic. She ate it up. She had a crunch of her dry biscuits and she sipped from her water bowl while we hovered over her admiringly. Then she used her new litter, litter tray while we turned our backs discreetly. I showed Susan how to deal with it. It's a little bit disgusting, but nowhere near as bad as changing Tiger's nappies, I said. Oh dear, it's weird. I even miss Tiger, though I don't miss changing him. Maybe he'll be potty trained when he comes back from Australia. We washed our hands and Lucky licked her paws, and then I set out breakfast on the table. When Dad joined us, his hair all wet and sticking up from the shower, he was wearing his silliest smiley face t-shirt and his jogging bottoms. I'd have died if he were, wore them in front of Rhiannon. But I felt safe with Susan. We both had a big bowl of cornflakes for our breakfast. Susan tipped hers into a bowl and then started touching each one of the tip with the tip of her spoon. What are you up to? said Dad. Susan went pink. I I'm just seeing how many I've got, she mumbled. We've got plenty of cornflakes, sweetheart. There's another packet in the cupboard, said Dad. No, Dad. Susan just likes to count things. I smiled at Susan. I bet you're looking to see if you've got exactly a hundred. I bet you have, said Susan. Well, why don't you two daft girls tip your cornflakes into a plate? They'll be much easier to count then. Do you want a cup of tea, Susan? Do you, do you take sugar? I hope you're not going to count the grains of sugar. You'll go cross-eyed. Dad crossed his own eyes, pulling a funny face. Susan laughed and pull it, pulled her funny face back. I do like your dad, she whispered when, she, when, he, when we went upstairs. I like your dad, I said politely. Yours is much more fun and he doesn't mind my numbers thing. It drives my dad nuts. He says it's obsessive compulsive behaviour and I should have therapy. Susan paused. Do you think I'm a bit nuts, Floss? Not at all. Your dad might be ever so clever, but he doesn't know everything. You just like numbers. Same as I like making lists. Right, let's make a list of all the things we've got to do today, I said, going into my bedroom. I made a big thing of looking for my notebook and a pen. I didn't want Susan to be floundering for something nice to say about my bedroom. It looked smaller and shabbier than ever with cardboard boxes everywhere. Susan curled up on the duvet in the corner. It might be a bit furry. I'm letting Lucky sleep on it at the moment, I said. I shall get it as furry as possible and then see if I make my dad sneeze, said Susan. 
She reached up to my pillow. Ellerina and Dimble were lurking bashfully underneath, but their little woolly paws were protruding. Who are they? she said, tweaking them. I made Ellerina pirouette, waving her trunk. Dimble became very shy and hid for a long time, but we gradually lured him out. They're so sweet, said Susan, but they're naked. Let's make them some clothes later on. Put on your list, Floss. Oh yes, can you sew properly then, Susan? Well, sort of. Did your mum show you? I asked wistfully. No, mum can't even sew buttons on. My dad sews a bit. I worked out how to do different stitches, and I can join bits together, though I don't always do it properly. You are clever, Susan. I'm not clever at making things up like you are, she said. You're the one who's so good at pretending that things seem real, like Ellerina and Dimble. Have you got any other dolls and teddies? No, I said mournfully. I was such an idiot. I threw them all out because Rhiannon made me feel such a baby. I wish I still had them. I hate it that they're just mouldering and sad in some stinky rubbish pile. I wish I'd at least given them a proper funeral. Hey, that would have been really cool in cre a creepy kind of way. A doll funeral. I could have given them each a shoebox as a coffin. It would have been like there'd been a mega disaster in doll land. Maybe some crazy robot toy ran amok with a machine gun and butchered all my Barbies. We could have a memorial service that happens a couple of months after the funeral. My mum went to one for the, prin for the principal of her college. You sing hymns and say poems about the dead person. We could do that for your dolls. I'll put that on my list. We'll have a memorial service and we'll make clothes for Ellerina and Dimble. And I know what I'd also really like to do. Have you ever made a friendship bracelet, Susan? No, but I'd love to. I'll make you one, shall I? And I'll make you one for you. I've made one for my dad, blue to match his jeans. We heard Dad thumping up and down the stairs, shifting boxes. Shall we help him, said Susan. Yes, let's. We'll put that first on our list. Number one, pack up the house. I wrote it in capital letters. It wasn't as easy as it sounded. My own things were easy enough because they'd been pared down to the barest minimum by, by mum. Susan and I filled one box with my shoes, my underwear, my night things and my washing things. We filled another box with my home clothes and my school clothes and my princess dress. I was wearing my newly washed and ironed birthday jeans and top. I left the rhinestone designer denim, denim outfit in the wardrobe till last. What is this? said Susan, trying the cap on. It looked comfortingly ridiculous on her too. I reminded her about Rhiannon's mother. I suppose it was very kind of her, but I hate it. I look such a fool, I said. Well, you don't have to wear it, said Susan. Maybe we should put it on the hottest wash in your washing machine and shrink it right down till it fits Ellerina. Yes, she'd look really cute in it, and the cap would balance her big ears. I crumpled the outfit up and stuffed it in the box. It felt good, as if it was Rhiannon, and I was stuffing her in the box too. I can't stick Rhiannon now, I said. How come I had her as my best friend, when really she's my worst enemy, her and Margot? Rhiannon couldn't get, get at us in the classroom now, because we'd moved our front desk out of her reach. However, she and Margot and Judy lurked in the corridors at lunchtime and called us stupid names and said rude things and then cackled with laughter. Margot wore the rose quartz bracelet now. Rhiannon must have given it to her, as if I cared. It looked as if Rhiannon and Margot were definitely best friends now. Judy still trailed around with them, telling ruder and ruder jokes, but Rhiannon and Margot simply sniggered and then ignored her. I feel a bit sorry for Judy now, I said. She's the one who's ended up without a real best friend. Don't feel sorry for her. She's been horrible to you and me, said Susan. She was the one who started up the whole swatty potty lark and the smelly chip bit. I paused. I bent my head, surreptitiously sniffing the cloves in the box. Then I buried my head in my chest and breathed deeply, trying to sniff me. Are you doing yoga, Floss? Susan said. No, no, I'm... Look, Susan, do I smell of chips? Mrs Horsfield said I should hang my clothes in a fresh air, but that's a bit of a problem unless I find some way of pegging them to my swing. That's my best thing. I'm going to have to get Dad to untie it, even though it took ages to get it fixed up. I love swings. Should we put swinging on your list? Susan suggested. Well, you can't really swing properly. It goes kind of lopsided. Still, of course we can swing. You ever so tactfully change the subject. I do smell of chips, don't I? Yes, you do. You smell absolutely delicious, and if you don't watch it, I shall eat you all up, said Susan. She seized Ellerina and Dimble. Yum, 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 she said, making her little, their little woolly mouths nibble me. I doubled up laughing because they were all tickling me. Then I gave Susan a quick hug. You're the best friend in the world, Susan, I said. Let's stay friends forever and ever. Yes, forever and ever, said Susan, solemn now. Can we stay friends right through this summer holidays? Of course we can. We can play together all the time. That would be lovely. Only some of the time we have to go to our house in France, but I'll write and phone you heaps, I, okay? You will still f stay friends? You bet. 
And even if Dad and I move on somewhere else after staying at Billy the Chip's house, will you stay friends? Absolutely. Even if you end up going to Australia to live with your mum. In fact, I'll come and visit you and play with the koalas. And what about if I go to the moon? Will you come and visit me in your spacesuit and do a dance with me in your moon boots? I did a slow, bouncy moon dance. Susan joined in. We danced in and out and around about the cardboard boxes. Dad put his head around the door and laughed at us. He put an empty cardboard box on each foot and lumbered about doing his own crazy moon dance. And then we all collapsed laughing. I don't know what I'm doing clowning around. There's still much to be done, said Dad. I've just got to pack my books and crayons and stuff in my pink pull-along case. And then we can help you, Dad, I said. We can number each box and write on it what's inside, said Susan. You're obviously a girl of a system, said Dad. Susan was great at getting both of us organised. She found some old brown sticky tape and sealed each box so we could balance one on top of the other. We finished my room, though we left out clean clothes for tomorrow, and Ellerina and Dimble and my sewing set and Lucky's duvet. She didn't like all this sudden activity and burrowed right underneath the duvet, just her nose and whiskers peeping out. Dad started to tackle his bedroom while we put, got started on the living room. There wasn't really much to take. We packed, one, the cuckoo clock, though it didn't work. It had been Mum and Dad's wedding present from Grandma, and for as long as I can remember, the hands had been stuck at four o'clock and the cuckoo sulked inside his house, though you could still see him if you opened the little doors. Two, the motorbike calendar. Dad had inked stars and smiley faces every weekend with floss, written in curly writing. Last month he'd written floss, floss, floss in every single box. Three, the photo of Mum and Dad and a baby me at the seaside, all sitting on the sand and licking ice cream. I remembered that day and the heat of the gritty sand and the coldness of the ice cream dripping onto my tummy. You were such a cute, cute little toddler, Floss. Look at all your fluffy curls, said Susan. Your mum's ever so pretty too. She looks so young. Mum was cuddled up to Dad in the photo, licking his ice cream instead of her own. Dad was pretending to be cross with her, but you could still see just how much he loved her. I sighed. I wish I could rewind to when we were all happy together, I said. I sniffed hard. Susan patted my shoulder sympathetically. We could really do with some bubble wrap, she said. Never mind, we'll have to make do of newspaper. We were leaving the television because it didn't work properly anyway. I packed all my favourite films, number four on the list, hoping that Billy the Chip might have a video recorder, though if his crackly old transistor radio was anything to go by, he didn't seem up to speed with his electrical equipment. We were leaving the table and chairs. The tabletop was patterned with coffee mug rings and the woven seats of the chairs were coming unravelled and scratched your bottom. Even so, I sat down on each one, remembering when we were mum and dad and me, with one leftover chair for all my teddies and barbies. They were forever falling off, the teddies too limp to sit up properly, and at the slightest nudge the barbies jackknifed onto the floor with their legs in the air. Mum would get cross, but dad always helped me get them back up onto the chair. He'd sometimes put a baked bean or a chip on each of my doll's house plates for my fidgety family. Did your dad really never pretend to play pretend games with you? When you were little, Susan, I asked. He read to me and did funny noises and funny voices, and he played weighing and measuring games and guessing words on pieces of card, but that was like baby lessons. My mum played music to me and I had to act it out. Sometimes we played I was a little French girl called Suzanne, but that was so I could count up to a hundred in French. You're such a brainy box, Susan, I said. Don't, said Susan, as if I'd insulted her. I'm paying you a compliment. You're heaps and heaps brainier than me. It's not that great a deal being brainy, said Susan. She sat down on the sofa, sighing. I went to sit beside her. The sofa sagged badly and the corduroy was shiny with age. There were several big dark stains where Dad had split his coffee or, or his can of beer. We were leaving the, the sofa too. I wished we could somehow take it with us. It wasn't just because it was where Dad and I cuddled up and watched the telly. When I was little, it had been a fairy tale castle and a wagon train across the prairie and a bridge over the man-eating crocodiles crawling across the carpet. I wondered if we could just take one of the sofa cushions, I said, tugging at it. It's a bit tired looking, Susan said, as tactfully as she could, and it would take up a whole cardboard box all by itself. Yeah, I suppose, I said, stroking the sofa, sofa as if it was my giant pet. Should we go and see how your dad's getting on with his packing? Susan said, going for dictionary, diversionary tactics. Dad was having similar problems. He was slumped on the edge of his bed, his clothes scattered all over the duvet, so it looked as if there were twenty dads sprawled beside him. There were mum things too, clothes I'd completely forgotten about, an old pink toweling dressing gown, a sparkly evening frock with one strap drooping. 
a worn woolen jacket with a furry collar, even some old Chinese slippers, embroidered satin with one of the butterflies unravelling. Dad, I said, and I went and sat beside him while Susan hovered tactfully in the doorway. Where did all Mum's stuff come from? I picked up one of the slippers, rubbing my finger across the satin. I remembered sitting watching television long ago, leaning back against Mum's legs, stroking her satin slippers, feeling the little ridges of embroidery with my fingertip. Your mum left them in her, her half of the wardrobe when she went off with Steve. She didn't want them. I was supposed to get rid of them, but I couldn't. Dad sighed, shaking his head at himself. Daft, aren't I, Flossed? You're not daft, Dad. I suppose it's time to deal with them now. You can still keep them. We can pack them all up in a cardboard box. No, no. It's time to chuck them out. Time to chuck half of my stuff, too. Dad picked up the jeans that he'd got torn on the fair and flapped the tattered legs at us. I thought you were going to keep them as decorating trousers. Who am I kidding? When was the last time I did any decorating, for heaven's sake? You painted my chest of drawers silver and left it half finished. I still love it. Can I take it to Mr Chip's house, Dad? It won't take up much room. OK, OK. Definitely, little darling. So, how are you two girls getting on with packing up your bedroom, Floss? We're finished, Dad. Susan's absolutely ace at getting everything sorted. Well, aren't we lucky? Thank you so much, Susan. You're a sweetheart. I wish I had a smashing friend to sort me out, said Dad. I'd like to be your friend too, Mr Barnes, said Susan. We can start sorting your clothes for you if you like. That's very kind of you, Miss Potts, said Dad, and I could sort out a tasty snack, seeing as you both worked so hard. Now let me see, would you like chip butties or chip butties or indeed chip butties? We both put our heads on one side, pretending to consider, and then yelled simultaneously, chip butties! It was a joy to see Susan eating her very first chip butty. Dad served it to her on our best blue chi china willow pattern plate, garnished with tomato and lettuce and cucumber. Susan ignored the plate and the little salad. She didn't use the knife and fork Dad had set aside beside the plate. She picked up the chip butty in both hands, staring in awe at the big soft roll split in half and crammed with hot golden chips. She opened her mouth as wide as possible and took a big bite. She shut her eyes as she chewed. Then she swallowed and smiled. Oh, thank you, Mr Barnes. It's even better than I hoped it would be. You make the most wonderful chip butties in the whole world. After we'd eaten every mouthful of our chip butties, we sorted Dad's clothes into good, not too bad, and chuck. Susan counted and I made a list. Dad's clothes, good, 12 items of clothing, including one tie and socks and shoes and underwear. Not too bad, 20 items of clothing, chuck, 52 and a half items. The half was an ancient pair of pyjama bottoms. We couldn't find the top. Dad laughed ruefully and started obediently chucking his stuff into a big plastic bag. He took Mum's old clothes, hesitated and then started chucking them too. Maybe we don't have to chuck all of them, Mr Barnes, said Susan. We couldn't have them, could we? Do we want to dress up in them, I asked a little doubtfully. No, we want to make them into clothes for Ellerina and Dimble, said Susan. We borrowed Dad's sharp kitchen scissors and some greaseproof paper to make patterns. It took a lot longer than I'd realised, but after two extremely hard-working hours, Ellerina had a sparkly strapless dance dress, Dimble had a fur coat, and they both had pink dressing gowns, and tiny embroidered slippers tied to each of their four paws with sewing thread. We'll cut the legs right off your dad's ripped jeans and make them little denim jackets, and Ellerina can have a skirt and Dimble can have dungarees. He'd look so cute. And caps, I asked. Well, I could give it a go, just so long as you don't ever, ever wear yours, said Susan. She waggled her fingers. They ache now. Mine too. Yet I wanted to work, our, work on our friendship bracelets. We can do them another time, said Susan. We're going to have lots and lots of times. You will come to my house, won't you, Floss? And I'm sure Billy the Chip won't mind you coming to his place. And then my voice tailed away. I didn't have any idea where we'd be after that. It was so scary not knowing. Let's go and have a swing, I said quickly. It goes a bit wonky, but you can still swing quite high if you really kick your legs. We went out to the backyard. Lucky came with us and circled the wheelie bins. I always worried whenever she slipped out of sight, but she bobbed back each time. I let Susan have first go on the swing, but she wasn't really any good at it. So I stood on the seat behind her and pulled on the ropes and bent my knees and got the swing going. We didn't really go that high, but we pretended we were swooping right up in the air, over the treetops, flying far over the tallest tower, up and up and up. Whee! You were right over the sea now, I shouted. And there's land again. See all those skyscrapers. We're over America. I think it's more like France, Susan said breathlessly. No, no, look, more sea. We're swooping round and down. And here's Australia. See all the kangaroos. Whoops. 
there's a boomerang. Who's that waving? It's my mum. Hey there, it's me, Floss. Meet my best friend, Susan. We both let go of the swing with one hand and waved wildly into thin air. And that is where we will leave part eight of Candy Floss by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.